Namaste, Saraswati Devi, Gauravani Pracharine, Nirvisesha, Sunyavadi, Pastatya De Satarine, Vantakalpa Trubias Cha, Kapasinubia Eva Cha, Patitanam Pavanavia, Voishnavavia Namo Namaha, Vaja Shi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shi Adoy Tagaradhar, Shi Vasadi Gaur Bhaktarinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. <clears throat> well, we're going to forego the eight prayers this morning or this, this evening because uh, this, this is a rather long story. And I uh, wanted to make sure we gave as much time as possible to the uh, Pass of Mike Kirtan that follows. So I want to thank Dwarkadas for uh, the earliest uh rendering of this that I'm aware of, I had not, I was not familiar with what happened with A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami uh, regarding his taking of sannyas. I had heard a nice story, which I will relate to you later, uh, about how he decided to leave householder life, what, what, you know, led to that. And, um, but on this day, September 17th, in 1959, Abhi Charan Day became A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj. And uh, this is the story of how it came about. One night, in the 1940s, Abhi Charande had an unusual dream. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, his spiritual master, appeared before him in the dream, beckoning. He was asking Abhi to leave his home and take sannyas. Srila Prabhupada woke up in an intensely emotional state. How horrible, he thought. He knew it wasn't an ordinary dream that this was his spiritual master coming before him. And yet the request just seemed so difficult at that time and so unlikely that to take sannyas? <sighs> At least it was not something that he could do immediately because now he had to improve his business. And with the profits, he wanted to print his books and the other books that, that uh, uh, the teachings of Lord Chaitanya and so on and so forth. And so, although this dream was in the back of his mind and he remained very shaken, he went on with his householder duties. In 1948, however, he closed his Lucknow factory. He had fallen behind in employee salaries. And since 1946, he had been paying his past rent in installments. But when the sales dropped off to almost nothing, continuing his factory just seemed to become impossible. Abhi Charan gradually lost everything. Srila Prabhupada recalled, looking back, ah, as I started a big factory and look now, those were the golden days. My business flourished like anything. Everything in the chemical business sold very well. But then, gradually, everything dwindled. Finally, with the help of a few acquaintances in Allahabad, he opened a small factory there. This is the same city where his pharmacy, the Prayag Pharmacy, had failed about 15 years before. He moved to Allahabad with his son, Vrindavan, and continued manufacturing medicines. He was very famous for his uh, uh, 
day's ointment, which I think you can still get, uh, was kind of like uh, mentholatum or, or uh, one of those uh, Vaseline kind of ointments. It had herbs and things in them. Anyway, the rest of his family remained in, uh, at uh, Banerjee Lane in Calcutta. Srila Prabhupada continued his traveling and selling, but now he was often home only for a little while, being away for months at a time. Then, in that same year, he had another dream. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati appeared before him. Again, he was beckoning, indicating that Abhay Charan should take sannyas. And once again, Abhay Charan had to put the dream aside. He was a householder. He had so many responsibilities. So many people depended upon him. To take sannyas would mean giving up everything. He had to earn money. And now he had five children. So why is Guru Maharaj asking me to take sannyas? He said to himself. It is not possible now. His Allahabad business was unfortunately also unsuccessful. Ah, at present, he wrote, the condition of our business is not good. He told his servant Gauranga, who had asked to rejoin him, when the situation gets better and if you are free at that time, I will call for you. He worked earnestly, very hard, but the results were very meager. As with everything else, Prabhupada saw this as, as the mercy of Krishna. He saw everything through the eyes of scripture. And he couldn't help but to think of the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Yasyam Anugarati Rami, Harishe Thadanam Shanait Tato Danam Tayajanti Asya Swagyana Dukha Dukitam. When I feel especially merciful, Krishna is saying, towards someone, I gradually take away all his material possessions, I take away his friends his relatives, and then reject this poverty-stricken and most wretched fellow. And then he surrenders unto me. He had heard Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati quote this verse many times, and now he thought of it. He understood that his present circumstances were controlled by Lord Sri Krishna, who was forcing him into a helpless position and thereby freeing him to begin preaching Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> he says, somehow or other, my intention for preaching the message of the Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu increased and the other side decreased. I was not disinclined for business, but Krishna forced me. You must give it up. The history is known, how it decreased and decreased and decreased. In Srimad Bhagavatam, Queen Kunti had prayed, my dear Lord Krishna, your lordship can easily be approached, but only by those who are materially exhausted. One who is on the path of material progress, trying to improve himself with respectable parentage, great opulence, high education, and bodily beauty. Such a person cannot approach you with sincere feeling. And to top this off, he had an experience with his wife, which pretty much sealed the deal 
that he wanted to retire from householder life. He'd been considering this. And for many years in the late 40s, he wrote the English translation of Bhagavad Gita. And after many years writing on the back of, of papers that had been used in offices that, you know, he only used the one side of the paper that hadn't been used and so forth. He, he had compiled the entire Bhagavad Gita and he put it uh, near the altar in his room at his home with his family. This was about 1954, I think. And he went away, as I said earlier, that he'd been away for many months at a time. He would go away to sell the uh, chemicals that he was producing. And while he was away, his wife ran out of rice. They needed rice. They had no rice. They had no, nothing to feed the family. And as luck would have it, in a few days later, a rice salesman came to the door selling rice. And she's like, oh, how wonderful that you have come, Mr. Rice Salesman. We need rice desperately. Please give us a few kilos of rice. And the rice salesman said, yes, no problem. I'll give you whatever you need. Here's the price. Well, Mrs. Day looked down and almost burst into tears because she had no money. The rice salesman didn't know what to do. This was his, his living. He looked around and he saw the Bhagavad Gita that Srila Prabhupada had written. And he said, what is that? And she said, oh, it is Bhagavad Gita. If you like, I will trade you for the rice. He's like, okay, you trade me. I'll give you X number of kilos of rice for this Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> well, of course, when Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami came home, or Abhicharan, as he was known, came home after months on the road trying to make money for the family, he's like, where is my Bhagavad Gita? Oh, um... We had no rice, so I gave it to the rice salesman in exchange for rice. We had no way to live. We had no food. You did what? You did what? It was that same year, 1954, that he decided to take Vanaprast to leave family life so that he could devote himself to his preaching. By the way, he looked all around for the rice salesman, tried to find him, asked around, never was able to find him. So, Bhaktivedanta says, I retired practically, not totally retired, but a little bit in touch with business, whatever is going on. Then, almost, my business became nil, nothing. Whatever was there, all right. You do whatever you like. One night in the 50s now, Abhicharande had a striking dream. It was the same dream he had had so many times before. During his days as a householder, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati appeared just as Srila Prabhupada had known him. Tall, scholarly sannyasi, coming directly from the spiritual world, from Krishna's personal entourage. He called to his disciple, Abhicharan, and ind indicated that he should follow. 
Repeatedly, he called and he motioned. He was asking Abhicharande to take sannyas again. Come, he urged, come, be a sannyas. After this, Srila Prabhupada awoke in a state of wonder. He thought of this as, as special instruction, as, as another feature of the original instruction that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had given him earlier at their very first meeting back in the 20s in Calcutta. It was the same instruction that his spiritual master later solidified in a letter. Become an English preacher and spread Krishna consciousness throughout the Western world. Sannyas was for that purpose. Otherwise, why would his spiritual master have asked him to accept it? Siddha Prabhupada reasoned that his spiritual master was now saying, you should take up sannyas and you will actually become able to accomplish this mission. Formerly, the time was not right, but now, now you should do this. Well, Abhicharande deliberated cautiously. Accepting sannyas is no small matter. By accepting sannyas, a Vaishnava dedicates his body, his mind, his words, everything, totally in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Renouncing all other engagements. Now, he was already doing that in his Vanaprastha life. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had offered sannyas to many of his leading disciples so that they could continue his mission. But none of them had been able to really do it. Preaching in the West had proved insurmountable, supremely difficult, and even perilous. Even for the Gaudiamath's most recognized and acknowledged sannyasis. So how could he, a mere householder, presume to succeed where so many other qualified devotees had failed? He was hesitant. The helplessness, the, the unqualified, the incapable, the feelings of incapability and qualification had, that he had expressed in his viraha ashtaka was there, staring him in the face, feeling, I have no qualification. But now, his own spiritual master was again beckoning him over all other considerations, even over his natural humility. Now, even though he was elderly and alone, the desire to preach, just as his spiritual master had preached, remained within him, a fierce, although quiet, determination. The Vedic standard and example set by previous acharyas was that if one were to lead a preaching movement, then he must take sannyas. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had taken sannyas in order to facilitate his missionary work. Lord Chaitanya himself had also taken sannyas to further the Sankirtan movement. Of course, Lord Chaitanya is the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. But when his young students had become disrespectful towards him, treating him as an ordinary man, he decided to take sannyas. Because a sannyas is a position of respect. It's automatically that person is given respect. It was a calculated tactic. As soon as he began traveling through India as a sannyasi, he immediately attracted thousands of followers to the Sankirtan movement. Knowing that many unqualified cheaters simply accept the saffron dress 
and abuse the respect given to sannyasis, especially in this age of Kali. Lord Chaitanya had advised against accepting sannyas in this age. He knew that cheaters in the guise of sadhus would act immorally, accumulating funds for their own sense enjoyment and making many followers simply to enhance their own prestige, posing as swamis or masters. They would cheat the public because in, in Kali Yuga, people are generally unable to follow the rules and regulations of sannyas. Lord Chaitanya had recommended that they simply chant Hare Krishna. However, if a person could actually follow the rules, and especially if he had to spread the Sankirtan movement, then sannyas would be necessary. Abhicharan first had to approach one of his godbrothers for permission. He decided to turn to Bhaktivilas Tirtha Maharaj, the leader of the Chaitanya or Gaudiya Math in Calcutta. Srila Prabhupada still thought of the Chaitanya Math as the headquarters of his spiritual master's Gaudiya Math mission. During the heated legal disputes, Chaitanya Math had been the most prized acquisition, and since 1948, it had been under the legal ownership of Bhaktivilas Tirtha Maharaj. Now, although each sannyasi had his own place or places, the Chaitanya Math and Tirtha Maharaj legally represented the Gaudiya Math entity as a whole. Srila Prabhupada felt that if he were going to be able to take sannyas and go preach in America, he should give Shaitanya Math the opportunity to support and favor his work, sponsor his work. In April of 1959, Avi Chiran wrote to Tirtha Maharaj inquiring about sannyas, as well as about the Chaitanya Math's printing of some of his manuscripts. And since no one else was going abroad, he volunteered to do so on behalf of the Chaitanya Gaudiya Math. Tirtha Maharaj replied that Abe should first join the Chaitanya Math, become a member. He mentioned the strife that still lingered from the legal battles in the courts. Those who are against the Chaitanya Math, he said, they are motivated by their individual ambitions. Anyone who was against this Chaitanya Math, he said, was acting illogically and against the instructions of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And so, according to Tirtha Maharaj, the proper thing for Srila Prabhupada to do, the thing that he had neglected to do for so many years, was to actually join the Gaudiya Ma and act under Tirtha's directions. Tirtha Maharaj mentioned several members of the Chaitanya Ma who had recently accepted the Sannyasi order. And he said that Abe could also become one in due time. He invited Srila Prabhupada to come and reside at the Chaitanya Math grounds. The house we have, there are rooms that you're, they're very airy and well lit. We will treat you exclusively. There won't be any difficulty for you. We will take care that you have no inconveniences. <coughs> As for printing books, he said, we are eagerly awaiting to print the books like Satsandarbha, Vedanta, and other Vedanta-based books on devotional service, and many other rare books by the Goswamis. First, we have to print them. Books written by you, 
will be checked by the editorial staff. And if the funds can be raised, then maybe we can print them according to priority. You must understand that the books will be printed only if they are favorable for the service of the Chaitanya Gaudiya Math. Thereafter, if the funds are if the funds are raised, then there may also be a plan for you to go abroad as well. Well, to say the least, Srila Prabhupada, Abhay Chirande was not encouraged. The main difficulty he felt was the Chaitanya Math's shortage of funds. Srila Prabhupada said, So, I was working with my broken typewriter. I went to our Tirtha Maharaj. I said, you give me a room and you print my books. And then give me some money. Then I will join you. I had thought, this is my Guru Maharaj's institution. Tirtha Maharaj didn't say no. But the printing of books was a difficult task for him as he had no money. He was hardly collecting enough to maintain the buildings. The printing of the books is a big job and there is no guarantee of any sales. Without printing books, without going to the West, sannyas really didn't have much meaning for Abe Charande. And who knew when Tirtha Maharaj would sanction his taking of sannyas? For him, there was no point in going to Calcutta just to reside in some airy, well-lit room. He already had that in Vrindavan. So Abhi wrote back to Tirtha Maharaj, mentioning his direct order from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati to preach to the English-speaking people, not only in his dreams, but also the letter that it was written to him to this effect. He wanted to go to the West right away, and he had thought that Chaitanya Math would welcome his offer. He said he understood that both, uh, both he and Tirtha Maharaj had their different responsibilities, but... Perhaps they could work together to carry out the desire of their spiritual master. Srila Prabhupada asked Tirtha Maharaj to reconsider. And so, on May 7th, 1959, Bhakti Vilas Tirtha Maharaj wrote back. He said, My suggestion is don't take any hasty decisions. For the time being, you should stay with us, and you should encourage yourself in the service of our society, and then accept Tridandi Sanyas in due time. The purpose of accepting Tridandi is to serve the society. If that is your desire, then the Chi Chaitanya Gaudiya Math will decide about your going to America to preach, and they will make all the arrangements. It can never be the principle of the society to let one act according to his individual whim or desire. The society will decide after consulting with the heads of the society what is to be done by whom. That is all I have to say on that. First of all, it is necessary to identify oneself with the society. This is already sounding an awful lot like ISKCON. It's a very similar situation. You must become a member. In order to preach in America, he went on to say, or in any other foreign country, it is important that you have a dignified organization 
in the background. You have to come from, you know, you have to have the, the stuff. You have to have the stuff behind you. And secondly, it's necessary to establish oneself in India. You have to make a name for yourself in India, in other words, before going on to preach in some foreign country. Nowadays, there are no conferences or meetings in the West as there used to be in olden days. Communication is done mainly through the medium of television. Well, Srila Prabhupada could understand the needs and priorities of the Chaitanya Gaudiya Math, but he could not allow them to overrule what he considered the highest mandate, preaching, as Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had ordered him to do. So, Abhicharande had offered his services to the leaders of the Chaitanya Gaudiya Math, thinking that they might somehow see things his way. He thought that with the world's crying need for Krishna consciousness staring them in the face, they might see that this poor fellow, Abhicharan Babu, was convinced and enthusiastic and so should be sent right away with whatever it was he required. But it would seem that they had other priorities, other things they had to do that were more important. Srila Prabhupada next turned to Keshav Maharaj in Mathura. And Keshav Maharaj told him he should take sannyas immediately. After corresponding with Tirtha Maharaj, Avicharan had felt some uncertainty about whether or not he should accept sannyas. But now that he's being encouraged so strongly, he found himself resisting Keshav's suggestion. But Keshav Maharaj was insistent. Bhaktivedanta Swami said, so I'm sitting alone in Vrindavan, writing. Meanwhile, my godbrother insisted to me, Bhaktivedanta Prabhu, you must do it without accepting the renounced order of life. Nobody can become a respected preacher. And so he insisted. But Prabhupada says, not he insisted. Practically speaking, my spiritual master insisted. He wanted me to become a preacher. So he forced me through his god brother. You accept. <laughs> so I unwillingly accepted. Keshavji Gaudiya, Gaudiya Math was located in the midst of Mathura's downtown bazaar. Its main entrance was an arched doorway leading into a courtyard that was open to the sky through a metal grating up above. The architecture was similar to that of the Vamchi Gopalji temple. The atmosphere was secluded like a monastery. Srila Prabhupada was a familiar and welcomed figure here. He had lived here, written and studied in the library here. He had edited the Gaudiya Patrika and he had donated to the, he had actually donated the deity of Lord Chaitanya who stood on the altar beside the deities of Radha and Krishna. He's known as Sri Sri Radha Vino Viharaji. But this visit during September of 1959 was not an ordinary one. He entered the moth dressed in white as Abhay Charan de Abu. But he would exit soon. 
dressed in saffron as Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj. Avicharande had actually been living as a renunciate for some Gayatri mantra. Keshav Maharaj said that Abhi Charande would now be known as Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj and that Sanatan would be Muni Maharaj. After the ceremony, the two new sannyasis posed for a photo, standing on either side of their sannyasi guru who sat in a chair. B.P. Keshava Maharaj didn't impose any strictures on Srila Prabhupada. He simply encouraged him to go on preaching. Yet Srila Prabhupada knew that to become A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami did not mean merely that he had to just give up his family, his home comforts and business, but that he, as he had already done that some years ago. This changing from white cloth to saffron cloth from Ave Charande Babu to Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj had special significance. It was only a matter of time before Bhaktivedanta Swami would travel to the West as Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati had ordained. This was Bhaktivedanta Swami's realization of his new sannyas status. Keshav Gaudiya Patrika Mas account of the sannyas initiation included a biographical sketch of Sri Srimad Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj listing many of the major events of his life. The article concluded by saying, seeing this enthusiasm and this ability to write articles in Hindi, English, and Bengali, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj gave him the instruction to take the Tridandi Sannyas. For nearly one year, he had been ready to accept Sannyas. In the month of Bhadra, on the day on which, on the day on which Vishvarupa himself accepted Sannyas, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Swami at the Sri Keshavji Gaudiya Math accepted Sannyas from the founder of the Vedanta Samiti, Bhakti Prajnana, Prajnana Keshav Maharaj. Seeing him accept this ashram of enunciation, seeing this pastime for accepting the renounced order of life, we have attained a great affection and enthusiasm. That's the uh, conclusion which is still, still written in that temple today. And I had never read this. I don't know if any of you had or were familiar with the story behind this of uh, Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami's taking sannyas. I had, I had heard of Tirtha Maharaj. I had heard of Gaudiya Math. And I knew that there was not you know, there, there was some difficulty there, but I had no idea what was going on with Gaudiya Math. And, you know, one might well ask, you know, if this is a Gaudiya Math thing, why did he not represent Gaudiya Math? Now we know. Now we know the story. And it's very similar to Srila Prabhupada's, our own Srila Prabhupada's story. You know, you don't represent a group you don't represent an organization. Srila Prabhupada represents Krishna. Srila Prabhupada gives Krishna to those who really want Krishna. Thank you very much for joining me. I think we lost quite a few people, unfortunately. I hope it wasn't boring for you. And I want to thank you for uh, 
for joining me for this uh, uh, commemoration of Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami's accepting of sannyas. Thank you again. Namaste. Please accept my obeisances. Haribo. Hare Krishna. I'll turn it back over to Narayan Dasi for Pasamai Kirtan. Hare Krishna. Haribol Namaste, Sarshidaswar. Oh, uh, wait a minute. They're asking if we can do the Shishastak prayers. I guess. Yeah, we have time. <laughs> I guess so. I, I read it as quickly as I could because I was concerned about the time. Yes, we have more time, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Namo Siddha Sarupananda Paramahamsa Namine Gaura Karnana Swarupaya Radha Krishna Prasthayate Ancha Kalpatubhyas Chaka Pasindubhya Eva Chaka Patita Nam Bhavani Vivachna Bajasi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adoita Gadadhar Shri Vasadhi Gaur Bhakti Chaitanya Das Where's the, the harmonium? Thank you. Thank you. All glories to the Sri Krishna Sankirtan, which cleanses the heart of all the dust accumulated for years. It extinguishes the fire of conditional life, of repeated birth and death. The Sankirtan movement is the prime benediction for humanity at large because it spreads the rays of the benediction moon. It is the life of all transcendental knowledge and it increases the ocean of transcendental bliss and gives us a pure taste of that eternal nectar for which we are always anxious. Oh, my Lord, your holy name alone can render all benediction upon the living being. And thus, you have hundreds and millions of names like Krishna, Rama, Govinda, Allah, Jehovah, El Shaddai, Damodar. And in each of these transcendental names, you have invested all of your transcendental potencies. And there aren't even any hard and fast rules for chanting these holy names. Oh, my Lord, you have so kindly made approach to you easy by your holy names. But I am so fallen and so unfortunate. I have no attraction for them. One should chant the holy name of the Lord in a humble state of mind. Feeling oneself to be lower than the straw in the street. More tolerant than a tree. Devoid of all sense of false prestige. And ready to offer all respects unto others. In such a state of mind, one can chant the holy name of the Lord constantly. O oh, Almighty Lord, I have no desire to accumulate wealth, 
nor do I want for the company of beautiful women, nor do I want for any number of followers of mine. All that I want, my Lord, is that I might have your causeless devotional service in my life, birth after birth after birth. Son of Maharaj Nanda, I am the eternal servant. But even though I'm eternally your servitor, somehow or other, somehow or other, I've fallen. I've fallen into this deep ocean of material birth and death. Please, therefore, have mercy upon me. Pick me up. Pick me up from this ocean of death and place me as but an atom of dust upon your lotus feet. My Lord, when will my eyes be decorated with tears of love, flowing constantly while I chant your holy name? When will all the hair on my body stand on end and my voice choke up husky with love for you from the recitation of your holy name? Oh, Govinda, feeling your separation, I'm considering a single moment to be like 12 years and more. And tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain. Everything in this world is empty, vacant, useless, tasteless in the absence of you. I don't know anyone except you, dear Krishna, as my Lord. And you will always remain as such. Even though you may handle me roughly when you embrace me. Or you... You may make me brokenhearted by not being present before. You can feed me or you can make me starve. You can, you can save me or you may slay me outright. The choice is yours. For only you can do anything and everything. But you are my worshipful Lord. Unconditionally. Haribo, 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 Haribo. Hare Krishna.